All right. I think today's the last lecture. All right, so before I get into that then, so we have field trip coming up on Wednesday. So that's going to be trapping. We're going to meet down at the vans, and we will leave from there. I would suggest you make sure you dress warmly and have something that might be able to withstand mud or an inch or two of water. I, I can't guarantee how much water is out there because I don't know how much it's going to rain between now uh, and then. I'm going to wear my hip waders just because then I can go anywhere. Uh, what we're going to do out there is to pick up the traps. Uh, I will lead you around and show you some basic mammal sign and then we'll demonstrate radio tracking, how it's done. In order to do that, uh, I need some help potentially setting traps tomorrow. Are you still volunteering? Anybody else want to volunteer tomorrow afternoon? Time hasn't been set. Uh, I can talk with you then and see what time is, is best for you. All right, so that's what we're going to do. And then the following <coughs> Tuesday is the field, uh, following Monday, is the uh, practical. And then the following Wednesday is the field trip to the organization for map conservation. And we will leave at 8.30 for that field trip <coughs> from the vans down there. Okay, so it's the last lecture. All right, characteristics of mammals. Uh, we started off talking a little bit about evolution uh, of mammals and the idea that the Cenozoic was the age of mammals, whereas the Mesozoic was the age of the reptiles, the dinosaurs in particular. And what you see if you look at the fossil record is, is that mammals were a, a small group. They were not very diverse throughout the Mesozoic. And then as you got into the Cenozoic, there was a rapid diversification. The numbers and kinds of mammals greatly increased. And that huge increase coincided with three biological trends and a geological trend. And those biological ones were the disappearance of the dinosaurs, the spread of the angiosperms, and then the spread of the insects into the pollinator and herbivore niches now that you had more, more types of plants. So number one got rid of all of these large predators for us. Uh, the second and the third opened up a lot of potential feeding niches for the mammals. And then the last thing geological in nature was continental drift. If you have continental drift, then you are potentially separating populations, allowing them to go through anagenesis individually and ultimately speciation could and did occur. Then we started to look at some characteristics. Many of the characteristics of mammals deal with their, uh, their being homeothermic endotherms. So they maintain a fairly constant high body temperature, they're homeothermic. The source of that heat is from internal physical reactions, so they are endotherms. Going along with that, we have a double pump circulatory system, uh, LVOI, and a secondary palate. The double pump allows you to be more efficient. So you can pump more blood per minute to your uh, tissues than if you did not have a double pump system. Because when the blood goes from the heart to the lungs, that pressure becomes dissipated by <coughs> friction in all of the capillaries of the lungs. So instead of slowly sending that blood from the lungs to the tissues, we bring it back to the heart, pump it again under full strength, and then send it out rapidly to all of the tissues. The alveoli give us a huge surface area in our lungs so that mammals have the greatest surface area of any of the uh, vertebrates, and that then allows us to obtain oxygen from the environment at a higher rate so that we can pump it to our tissues at a higher rate. A secondary palate is not necessarily unique to mammals, but it probably was a requirement if you were going to chew your food and be a homeothermic endotherm. It allows that mammal to have food in its mouth and to have the air bypass the oral cavity and get down into the lungs so that we can maintain the high flow of oxygen into the lungs even though we're spending a prolonged time with food material in our mouth. Uh, mammals in general, they rely on scent communication more than in any of the other vertebrate groups, and so correspondingly they have a better olfactory sense than the other vertebrate groups. 
facial muscles were a big development. They were important in things like uh, communication because now you can smile and grimace and pucker and fun things like that. Uh, important for young in, in, uh, when they're uh, feeding on the nipple. And uh, yeah, just lots of good things for facial muscles. New adaptations for hearing. Well, we developed that external ear, a pinna, with, that helps uh, direct the sound waves into the ear canal, therefore increasing sensitivity to sounds. You combine that with the smooth, uh, the facial muscles that are modified uh, to move that ear, and it becomes even more sensitive. And then we have these three middle ear bones that amplify the sound from the tympanum to the cochlea, the incus, the malleus, and the stapes. And now I'm going to get to epidermal derivatives. Any questions on uh, stuff from last time? So we mentioned before the skin is made up of the two layers, the dermis and the epidermis. And, and throughout we've been talking about various structures that uh, are derived from the dermis or the epidermis. So in fish you had scales being derived from the dermis. In birds, you have feathers being derived from the epidermis. Well, in mammals, two of their very unique characteristics are derived from the epidermis. And these are going to be hair and various kinds of glands. So hair is exclusively mammalian. No other group has this particular material. made out of thousands of dead cells that are filled with a protein alpha keratin. And if you remember, the feathers and uh, reptilian scales are made out of Barrett beta keratin, so a slightly different form of molecule. Mammalian hairs are not homologous to the scales of reptiles or the scales, the, scales, uh, the feathers of a bird. Right, so this is a new structure, unique to the mammals. When that hair develops, so there's my epidermis and there's my dermis, we're going to have this evagination of the epidermis down into the dermis. That evagination or invagination is called a follicle, so it's a hair follicle. <coughs> and that hair is going to grow up from the <coughs> epidermal cells at the base of the follicle. So there's some similarities there with a bird, but it is different. Remember with the bird, you have this little bump here stretching way out, whereas in the mammals, there's only a small uh, projection at the bottom. This dermal layer, though, is important because remember the dermis brings the blood cells, brings the blood, has a blood supply, the epidermis does not. So the nutrients that are needed to make the new cells that contribute to the hair is coming from the bloodstream in the dermis at the base of that follicle. Right, we have two different parts of the hair that you can recognize. The part that is above. The follicle is the shaft. And the part that is in the follicle is the root. If you look at a section like this of a hair follicle, you'll often see a muscle going like that, a smooth muscle. called the erector pili muscle. What's it do? Raises the goosebumps. Raises the hair, gives you goosebumps. It erects the hair. Pili, pilus, is hair. I think that's uh, Latin. So I think you can see that if you have your hair like this, and it's rooted in that follicle, and you contract that particular muscle, 
the net effect is that it's going to go like that. The hair will stand up. That's a very important adaptation for mammals because that's one of the major ways in which they help keep themselves warm. No thermocomiotherms. You don't want to lose all your heat necessarily because if you do, you have to replace it by from internal energy. But by raising and lowering the hairs, you can adjust the amount of insulation that you have. So when you see that squirrel at zero degrees outside and it's up on a tree feeding on some walnut or something, he just looks like a puffball of fur because he's got his hairs correctly, totally trapping lots of extra air. You see that same squirrel in the summertime and he's smooth and sleek. And that's because all of those hairs are laying down as flat as possible. If we take this shaft and look at it under a microscope, see that it has a little bit more of a complex composition to it than you might think. So that's a long section of a hair. So that most hairs are going to have a central cavity, the medulla. It may be totally hollow may be partially hollow. The bulk of it is called cortex. Oops, why did I do that? Uh, we'll get to the beautiful. So the medulla is inner, <coughs> outer here. The bulk is the cortex. Medulla and cortex are very common terms if you ever take an anatomy course. You'll see it in relationship to the adrenal gland, the kidney, different parts of the brain. And then on the outside, looking somewhat like shingles, that's the cuticle. And we'll just throw this up here. Hairs are kind of interesting in uh, mammals because if you do look at them under the microscope, the structure of them and what you're seeing is, is generally the cuticle. The structure varies among usually different genera and sometimes even the different species. They have very, very distinct patterns. So this one just has uh, animals ranging from a golden mole. I can't even remember what family the golden mole was in. Uh, marmot, uh, ground squirrel, beaver, mink, skunk, horse, cat. Okay, they are very different. If you get a chance, you can look at uh, this, these photographs over here. They were done by an undergraduate in uh, Dr. Walker's SEM class, and those are from different species of bats on the island of Puerto Rico. Some of them are very, very pretty, and the, actually, if you ever come to my house, you'll see I have one of those on my wall uh, in my living room. It's, it's biology can be art sometimes. Right? So very different surface patterns as evidenced by the cuticle of the hairs. You do have different types of hairs. The most common types of hairs are guard hairs and what's called under hairs. <clears throat> Guard hairs form the outer coat of the animal. They tend to be long hairs. Everything's going to be relative to the next group, so longer than the under hairs. They tend to be coarser. and very often not as abundant as the under hairs. So they're larger, they're coarser, not necessarily as abundant. These are the ones that are usually making contact with the physical environment. Under hairs are shorter, finer in texture. Depending on the animal, they can be extremely abundant compared to the outer guard hair.
two basic kinds.